welcome to chapter 12 of Wilson Rawls book Summer of the Monkeys. As I climbed in the buckboard I said, Grandpa, why are we stopping in town? We're going to buy some coconuts, Grandpa said. Coconuts, I said surprised. What are we going to do with coconuts? We're going to use them for monkey bait, Grandpa said. From what I read in those books, there's a one thing that monkeys really like to eat, and it's coconuts. I wanted to ask Grandpa a thousand questions, but just then we drove up in front of a very large building and stopped. This is Wiley Mercantile, Grandpa said. It's the biggest store in town. You can buy stuff, just about anything you need there. From a wagon and a team, you can buy a can of snuff and everything in between. While Grandpa was tying the team to the hitch rail, I had a good long talk with Rowdy. I told him that if he'd behave himself and not make any fuss, I'd bring him a piece of candy. Rowdy wasn't the least bit happy about me leaving him, but he did lay down in the buckboard. As Grandpa and I started into the mercantile, Grandpa said, <clears throat> Old Man Wiley owns this store. He's a fine old man, and honest as the day is long but I never can seem to be able to get along with him. He's always kind of rubbing me the wrong way. I thought Grandpa's store was big, but it didn't compare to the mercantile. It made the mercantile, the mercantile made it look like a chicken coop. The storekeeper was standing behind the counter when Grandpa and I came through the door. He was an old man and reminded me of Grandpa. As we stepped up to the counter, he looked over his glasses at us and said, what can I do for you? Grandpa looked over his glasses right back at him and said, Do you have any coconuts? The storekeeper smiled and said, You're in luck. I just got a half bushel of them. They're still in the storeroom. How many do you want? Grandpa frowned, drumming his fingers with his left hand on the counter. He mumbled to himself, A half bushel? Then he spoke up and said, Well, I guess we'll take all of them. The storekeeper drew back and said, the whole half bushel? Yes, Grandpa said, the whole half bushel. As the storekeeper turned to go to the storeroom and get the coconuts, he shook his head and said, boy, you must like some kind of coconuts, a whole half bushel. I do like coconuts, Grandpa growled. I've never in my life had all that I could eat at one time, so I'm gonna try now. I wanted to laugh, but I was afraid to. It's not a good idea to laugh at two old men when their dander is up. There's no telling what they're liable to do. On hearing someone giggle, I turned around. Over behind the candy counter was a girl about my age. She was looking straight at me. She was the prettiest girl I had ever seen. In fact, I didn't think girls got that pretty, but she just looked like a doll. Her hair was the color of sycamore leaves after the first frost. It hung down her back in two long braids and was tied with purple ribbons. She had a dimple on one cheek. At first I thought her eyes were blue, and then I decided they were green. Then I didn't know what color they were. Seeing ribbons in her hair reminded me of Daisy's ribbons. Boy, oh boy, Grandpa, I said, I almost forgot Daisy's ribbons. Grandpa laughed and said, if you'd forgotten those ribbons, neither one of us could have gone home. I walked over to the pretty girl and said, do you work here? She didn't say a word. She just smiled and nodded her head. I think I'd like to buy two spools of ribbon, I said, one pink and one blue. The girl turned and walked to the counter and I followed her. While she was getting the ribbon, I looked through the glass top of the counter and saw a tray of thimbles. Some looked like silver and some looked like gold. When the girl came back, I waited while she put the ribbons in a small paper sack. And then I said, how much are those thimbles? The girl said, they're 15 cents each. I'll take one of those gold ones, I said. What size do you want? She asked. Size, I said. I didn't know thimbles came in sizes. Oh, sure they do, the girl said. Small, medium, and large. It's for my mama, I said. I don't know what size she would need. Well, let's see, the girl said, holding her hand up in front of her and looking at it. Is your mother's hand any bigger than mine? I looked at her hand and I said, I don't know. My mama's hand could be bigger than yours. Holding her hand out to me, she said, 
Maybe if you held my hand, you could tell a little better. This really shook me up. I stepped back and said, I'm not going to hold your hand. What's the matter with you? She giggled and said, I was just trying to help. Didn't you ever hold a girl's hand? No, I said, and I'm not going to. She said, I think your mother would need a size medium. All right, I said, give me one of those. The girl put the thimble in a tiny box with cotton in it and handed it to me. Will there be anything else, she said. Yes, I said, as I shoved a little box down in my pocket. I'd like a dime's worth of jawbreakers. While the girl was getting the candy, I saw something that really took my eye. It was a snow white shaving mug with a fancy design on it. Some time back, Papa had dropped his shaving mug. The handle had broken off and it had a bad crack in it. He still used it, but I knew he would like another one. How much is that shaving mug? I asked the girl. It's kind of expensive, she said. It costs a quarter. I knew if I bought that mug, I'd be flat broke. But that didn't make any difference. I wanted Papa to have a shaving mug. I'll take it, I said. As I handed the girl my money, she said, My name's Patricia, but everybody calls me Patty. What's your name? Jayberry, I said. The girl giggled and said, Jayberry? That's a cute name. Cute, I said. I don't see anything cute about it. Where do you live? She asked. Up on the river, I said. I picked up my packages. Do you have a sweetheart? She asked. No, I don't have a sweetheart, I said, as I turned my back to her to walk away, and I'm not looking for one either. I heard her giggle. Grandpa had just paid the storekeeper for the coconuts when I walked up. He looked at my packages in my hand and said, what did you buy? I got a thimble for Mama, I said, and a shaving mug for Papa, and I got a little candy too for Rowdy and me. What about the ribbon? Oh, I got that too, I said. Grandpa picked up the basket of coconuts. I hurried and opened the door for him. Just as Grandpa started through the door, the storekeeper said, I hope you have all the coconuts you can eat this time. Grandpa stopped and looked at the storekeeper and very seriously said, I don't think that's possible. Maybe you should order another bushel for me. The storekeeper jerked off his glasses and glared at Grandpa. He said, there's something wrong with you. No, Grandpa said, there's nothing wrong with me. I just like coconuts, that's all. The girl in the store giggled. I looked at her and darned if she didn't haul off and wink at me. I slammed the door. With my face on fire and as hot as coals, I followed Grandpa to the buckboard. I thought, boy, that girl's got a lot of nerve. As Grandpa set the basket of coconuts in the buckboard, he said, you can put that package of ribbon in the basket with the coconuts, but if you'd like to hold on to that shaving mug, it's as rough as we go up the road and it could get broken. All right, Grandpa, I said. I picked up one of the coconuts and laid the ribbon in the basket and put the coconut on top of it. As Grandpa and I got into the buckboard, he said, What did you think of that pretty little girl? I think she's boy crazy, I said. She wanted to know my name, and she asked if I had a sweetheart. She tried to get me to hold her hand and even winked at me. I bet she winks at every boy she gets close to. Grandpa laughed and tapped the mares with the whip. You know, he said, the best way to stop a girl from winking at you is just to haul off and kiss her. That's the thing you got to do. Oh, Grandpa, I said, I'm not going to go kissing any girls. You know I couldn't do a thing like that. Why, I'd rowdy, rather kiss old Rowdy on the lips. I opened my sack of candy and plopped a big jawbreaker in my mouth. Would you like a jawbreaker, Grandpa? I asked and held one up to him. Grandpa looked at it and said, I don't believe I care for one of those right now, but thank you anyway. I don't think that jawbreakers and this star tobacco I'm chewing would mix very well. I laughed and said, I don't think that would mix very well either, Grandpa. Twisting around on the seat, I laid a jawbreaker in front of old Rowdy. He rolled it around on the floor of the buckboard with his tongue until it was good and wet, and then he lapped at it and swallowed it. I plopped another one in his mouth. He didn't even lick that one. He just stretched his neck long, and it went straight down. 
With a wiggling tail and a begging eye, Rowdy asked for another jawbreaker. Oh, Rowdy, I said, why do you gulp them down like that? You don't even taste them. You're supposed to hold them in your mouth and suck on them, or at least chew them. Well, I'm going to give you one more, and that's all you're going to get for a while. I heard Grandpa chuckling. Shifting the jawbreaker from one cheek to another, I leaned back and said, Grandpa, were you going to tell me how we're going to catch those monkeys? <clears throat> I don't think we'll have any trouble catching them this time, Grandpa said. All we need is those coconuts and a roll of chicken wire, a snap latch, and a ball of binder twine. Now I have the coconuts and I have everything we el else we need at the store. What are we going to do with all that stuff, Grandpa? I asked. We're going to build a big pen out of that chicken wire, he said. <clears throat> It'll have a top on it and a door with a snap latch. We'll put the coconuts right in the center of the pen and leave the door open. Then we'll tie the binder twine to the door and run it back through the pen and out into the bush a little ways. When those monkeys go into the pen after the coconuts, we'll pull the binder twine and latch the door. What do you think of this idea? Before I could answer, Grandpa, I closed my eyes and drew a picture of a, the pen in my mind. I could feel the excitement as it burned its way through me. Boy, Grandpa, I said, it sure sounds good to me. Is that what you read in a book? It sure was, Grandpa said. The story was about a man and a woman who lived in the Borneo jungles. All they did was trap monkeys, and they sold them to zoos all over the world. They caught thousands and thousands of monkeys, all kinds of monkeys. And they always used a pen, just like the one I was telling you about, to catch them. And they used coconuts as bait. It'll work, I tell you. We'll get those things this time for sure. Grandpa, I asked, are you going to tell, help me build that pen? I sure am, Grandpa said. We'll get your dad to help too. I'm going to lock up my store and do nothing but help you trap those monkeys. This monkey business has got to come to an end. It's beginning to bother me a little, and I, I can't remember the last time I had a good night's sleep. Grandpa had me so excited I almost swallowed my jawbreaker. With both Grandpa and Papa helping me catch those monkeys, I couldn't see a way that I could lose. Once again, I could almost see myself riding my pony and shooting my 22. Twisting around on the seat, I reached into the basket and lifted out one of the coconuts. As I held it in my hand, Grandpa said, or I said to Grandpa, I wonder why monkeys like coconuts so much. I don't know, Grandpa said. But it said in the book that there are two things that monkeys will never pass up, coconuts and bananas. I started turning the coconut over in my hands and just then I saw something I could hardly believe. The pointed end of it, underneath the brown hairy fur fiber, I saw what looked like two little black eyes and a tiny mouth. They made me look exactly like the face of a small monkey. I started laughing. Great big tears started streaming down my face. Grandpa said, what's so funny? Holding the coconut up for him to see, I cried, look, Grandpa, even these coconuts look like a monkey's head. Grandpa leaned over and peered at the coconut for a second. He grinned and said, well, I'll be darned. They do have a monkey face on them, don't they? I've never noticed that before. They should have called these things monkey nuts instead of coconuts, I said. Grandpa threw his head back and roared with laughter. He laughed so hard it scared the mares. They started zigzagging all over the road. Grandpa started sawing on his ch check lines and hollering, whoa, whoa, whoa. He finally got the mares quieted down. Still laughing and wiping tears from his eyes, he said, those monkeys may not know it now, but they got a big surprise waiting for them. They sure do, Grandpa, I said. I can hardly wait till we start building that pen. On reaching the river, Grandpa stopped the team and offered the reins to me again. Would you like to drive across the river again? He asked. This time I didn't hold back. I took the reins in my hands. Grandpa chuckled and said, you'd better call old Rowdy or he'll have to swim the river. Come on, Rowdy, I yelled. You better get up on this bug board or you're gonna get wet. Rowdy came tearing out from the underbrush and jumped up onto the buckboard. That crossing was easy. 
The water didn't seem to be half as deep as it had the day before. I didn't get the least bit scared this time. We were in the bottoms about a hundred yards from the river when I realized I was thirsty. I'm thirsty, Grandpa, I said. Would you like to have a cold drink of water? I sure would, Grandpa said. I've been thirsty ever since we left town. But where are we going to get a cold drink of water? I know where a spring is, I said. The water is as cold as ice. Where's the spring? Grandpa asked. It's just a little way down in the bottoms, I said. Grandpa drove the team to one side of the road and stopped them under a big sweet gum tree. As I tied the halter ropes to the mares of the gum tree, Grandpa said, As thirsty as I am, I think I'd walk a mile for a cool drink. Oh, Grandpa, it's not that far, I said, as I took off on a game trail. It's just a little ways down the road. As we walked along the trail, I noticed that Rowdy kept looking up into the trees. I grinned and said, look, Grandpa, Rowdy's even looking for those monkeys. I am too, Grandpa said. I'd sure like to see that hundred dollar monkey you've been talking about. Do you think he's around here somewhere? If he's around here, Grandpa said, we won't see him unless he wants us to. He could be sitting on top of that big sycamore right now watching every move we make. He's smart, I tell you. I don't care how smart he is, Grandpa said, looking up into the trees. If we ever get him in that pen, I can get a rope on him, and his smart days will be over. Grandpa was so serious, I couldn't help but laugh at him. When we arrived at the spring, Grandpa and I got down on our bellies and had a good long drink. Grandpa had a terrible time getting down. He wheezed and groaned and grunted, but he finally made it. As Grandpa got back to his knees, he took his handkerchief and wiped the water off of his chin. Boy, he said, that sure is good water. How'd you ever find this spring? As I lay back in the cool green grass, I said, oh, Rowdy and I found it. There are springs through these bottoms everywhere, but this has to be my favorite. I named it Jayberry Spring. That's not a bad idea, Grandpa said. Who knows? Maybe a hundred years from now, another old man and a Young boy will stop here and have a good cold drink of water from J. Berry Spring. You can't ever tell. Might even be a highway here by then. Oh, Grandpa said, nothing like that will ever happen to me. I'd be lucky if I had a grasshopper named after me. Grandpa chuckled. Well, that's not a bad idea either. If you could find a purple grasshopper and hang a name on it like J. Berry's hopper, it might just stick. You never can tell. We laughed, and I said, Grandpa, I sh we sure have a lot of fun together, don't we? Grandpa smiled and said, We surely do. You know, an old man like me can teach a young boy like you all the good things in life, but it takes a young boy like you to teach an old man like me to appreciate the good things in life. I guess that's what life's all about. I didn't quite understand what Grandpa was talking about, but it sounded pretty good to me anyway. Just then, Grandpa's mares started snorting and stomping their hooves. We could hear their trace lines jingling. Grandpa cocked his ear up and said, Sounds like something scared the mares. That's ah, probably an old hog or deer, I said. The bottoms are full of them. We could have spooked one up when we came down to the spring, and it ran at the team and scared them. The mares quieted down. As Grandpa got to his feet, he said, I guess that's what it was. It sounds like everything's all right now, though. Let's have one more drink in this spring water, and then we'll be on our way. It's getting to be a long day. When Grandpa and I got back to the buckboard, I said, Grandpa, look at Rowdy. Something's been prowling around here. Rowdy was sniffing around the buckboard. He was walking all stiff-legged, and every hair on his back was standing straight up. Watching Rowdy, Grandpa said, sure looks that way. I wonder what it was. I don't know, I said, but whatever it was, Rowdy doesn't like the smell of it one bit. Grandpa stepped over to the buckboard and looked in it. In a loud voice, he said, hey, our coconuts are gone and the basket is empty. Gone, I said, as I hurried over and looked into the basket. By golly, they are. But there's, there's something else in the basket. Grandpa grunted as he reached down into the basket, and he lifted up the dirtiest, most ragged pair of breeches I had ever seen in my whole life. 
holding him up in front of him, he said, I could be wrong, but this looks like a pair of britches to me. I would have never recognized my britches if I hadn't seen that pair, the patch on the seat of my pants. Suffering bulldogs, Grandpa, I said. Those are my britches. They're the ones I lost the day the monkeys got me drunk. I recognize that patch on them. Mama sewed it for me. Grandpa tossed the britches into the underbrush. Phew, he said, wrinkling his nose. By the way they smell, those monkeys have been taking turns wearing them about. I wouldn't doubt it, Grandpa said. Those monkeys are liable to do anything. Looking into the basket, Grandpa said, it looks like we have something else here. He reached in and lifted out a wet, soggy, nasty looking gunny sack. I could hear the jingling of metal when he picked it up. Wide eyed, I said, holy smokes, Grandpa. That's my gunny sack and my traps. I didn't think I'd ever see them again. Dropping the gunny sack in the buckboard, Grandpa reached in the basket again and said, huh, well, what do you know? And he lifted out my bean shooter. That's my bean shooter, Grandpa, I said all excited. I lost it the day I shot that $100 monkey in the belly. Grandpa started looking in the underbrush and he said, something's going on. I think somebody is playing tricks on us and I bet it's your daddy. I don't think so, Papa would do this, Grandpa, I said. As I looked up into the trees, I think I know who did this. It's the think it's your dad. He's playing tricks on us. Just then I saw a sight that took me several seconds to figure out. I couldn't even understand what I was seeing. I couldn't even believe it. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't even swallow. I couldn't even do anything but stand there with my mouth open and stare. I'd seen a lot of sycamore trees in my life, but I had never seen one as beautiful as the one looking in front of me strung from limb to limb all through the top of the tree were pink and blue ribbons that I had gotten for Daisy. Sitting on the limbs here and there were monkeys. Each one of them I could see was holding a coconut in his paws and they were just sitting there looking at Grandpa and me with no expression on their cute little faces at all. A gentle breeze was stirring in the top of the big sycamore. The ribbons were waving and fluttering. Brilliant flashes of pink and blue gleamed and shimmered in the sun's rays. That was an unbelievably beautiful sight. As if from far away and down deep in thought, I heard Grandpa say, What's the matter? Do you see something? Look, Grandpa, I cried, pointing up in the sycamore. Look at that. I bet you've never seen anything quite so pretty. Grandpa looked where I was pointed. I saw him reach and take a hold of the buckboard with one hand as if he were steadying himself. He looked down to the ground, shook his head, and looked again up into the big sycamore. He took off his hat, scratched the top of his bald head, and cleared his throat. What in the name of heaven is that? That's those monkeys, Grandpa, I said. They didn't just steal our coconuts. They stole all of Daisy's ribbons too, and they decorated that sycamore tree with them. Isn't it pretty? Grandpa never said a word. He just grunted and kept staring at the big beautiful sycamore. Then Jimbo walked out onto the big limb, and he was carrying a coconut in one of his paws. Grandpa threw his head back and said, what in the world is that thing? Grandpa, I said, you've been wanting to see that hundred dollar monkey. Well, let me introduce you. That's Jimbo. Grandpa said, why, that's no monkey. It's too big to be a monkey. That looks more like an ape to me. I don't care what he looks like, Grandpa. That's your Jimbo. He's the smartest thing you've ever seen in your life. Jimbo must have realized that we were talking to him and he decided to show off a little. Waving the coconut in the air, he started hopping down from limb to limb and uttering those deep grunts. In, surpri in a surprised voice, Grandpa said, What's that monkey doing now? He's talking to you, Grandpa. That's monkey talk. I saw Rowdy then take off down the road with his tail between his legs. 
Rowdy, I yelled, you come back here. Rowdy acted like he hadn't even heard me. He just put on a little more speed and disappeared around the bend in the road. Where's that hound going, Grandpa asked. He's going home, Grandpa, I said. He's afraid those monkeys might get a hold of him again. Jimbo had seen Rowdy take off from home and it pleased him. He opened his big mouth and made the bottoms ring with his sh shrill cries. Watching Jimbo, Grandpa said, if I didn't know better, I'd say that monkey is laughing at us. He is laughing at us, Grandpa. I've been saying this the whole time. He gets a kick out of anything like us. If he were down here on the ground, he'd probably turn a few somersaults for us. Mumbling something that I just couldn't understand, Grandpa reached down and picked up a good-sized stick. What are you going to do with that stick, Grandpa? I asked. I'm going to see if I can wrap it around that monkey's neck, Grandpa said. I don't like to have people laugh at me, much less a silly monkey. Oh, oh, Grandpa, I said, don't do that. Don't ever throw anything at those monkeys. They'll come down from those trees and jump on us and eat us up. Oh, Grandpa said, looking at me, they wouldn't do anything like that, would they? Uh, yes, they would, Grandpa, I said. I know, and I, and no one knows what those monkeys would do any better than I do. If you hit Jimbo with that stick, he'll sick those little monkeys on us and they'll eat us up. Grandpa must have believed what I was telling him. He dropped the stick and looked at the sycamore again. They're gone, he said. Where'd they go? I looked and sure enough, the monkeys had disappeared. I felt like bawling. Yeah, they're gone all right, I said. And so are our coconuts and my pony and my 22. Doggone it, just when it looks like I have the cinch on getting my pony in 22, something like this happens every time. What are we gonna do now? We're still gonna catch those monkeys, Grandpa said, as he untied the halter ropes from the gum tree. I'm mad now. Just because we lost those coconuts doesn't mean we have to give up. No siree, we're gonna catch those monkeys. How are we gonna catch them, Grandpa? We don't have any coconuts for bait. We're gonna build that pen just like I planned, Grandpa said. We'll use apples for bait. We'll use everything I have in my store if we have to. We're gonna catch those monkeys. Before Grandpa and I got to the buckboard, we took a Another look at that beautiful sycamore tree. Grandpa chuckled and said, you know, when you think about it, those monkeys did exactly, didn't exactly steal our coconuts. They made a trade. They traded us, traded us your old britches, the gunny sack, the traps, and the bean shooter for the coconuts. It's as simple as that. Grandpa said, now do you believe they're that smart? Yes, Grandpa said. As he climbed onto the buckboard, they're smart all right, but they're not smart enough. I still believe there has never been an animal that can't be caught. We'll see. When Grandpa and I came inside of our house, we saw Mama, Papa, and Daisy, and Rowdy standing on the porch. As we drove up, Papa said, is everything all right? When I saw Rowdy coming home, I kind of got worried. Grandpa didn't get out of the buckboard. He just sat there, holding the reins in his hands and looking at Papa. He shifted a little on the seat. I've never deliberately told a lie in my whole life, but if I thought I could tell one to get out of this, I would. I'm going to tell you what happened to us, but I don't think you're going to believe me. I saw it happen, and I don't even believe it. Taking his time, Grandpa told Papa everything that had happened to us down in the bottoms. Papa started laughing. I had never seen my papa laugh so hard in his life. He stood up and laughed. He bent over and laughed. He sat down on the porch and buried his face in his arms and laughed. And mama started laughing too. Rowdy got all excited and started bawling. And with all that laughter going on, I giggled a little myself. Everyone was laughing, everyone but Daisy. She didn't even crack a smile. With an angry look in her eyes, she just stood there looking at me. Grandpa either got mad or disgusted. Anyway, he looked at me and said, give me a few days to get things straightened out at the store and we'll start building that pen. We're gonna catch those monkeys and stop some of this laughing. He took off down the road with the buckboard bouncing and the dust boiling. 
Grandpa wasn't out of sight when Daisy said, Jay Berry, do you mean to tell me that you lost all my ribbons? I didn't lose them, Daisy. Those monkeys stole them. The ribbons are down in the bottom, strung up all over the top of a sycamore tree. Daisy said, you're always bragging what a good tree climber you are. Why don't you go climb that tree and get my ribbons back for me? Climb the tree, I exclaimed. Oh, Daisy, you don't know what you're talking about. I couldn't climb that sycamore. It's the biggest one in the bottom. Why, it's 150 feet to the first limb. With a fire flashing from her blue eyes, Daisy said, Jay Berry Lee, I don't care if it's 550 feet to the first limb. You could get yourself down to those bottoms and get my ribbon. That's the least you could do. Mama said, I think we better forget about the ribbons. I don't want him climbing any sycamore trees. I'm going to order some things from Sears and Roebuck and I'll get you three spools of ribbon. That helped to calm da Daisy's feelings a little, but not much. She was still upset about those stupid ribbons. Jay Berry, she said, I'm not going to speak to you for six months. I'm not even going to pass anything to the table at you. I needed those ribbons. I have five doll dresses completely finished and I wanted my ribbons for trim. Daisy had put me through the silent treatment several times in my life and I didn't like it one bit. I could put up with it for a few days and then it just got on my nerves. <clears throat> it seemed that while I was going to get the silent treatment, Daisy would stay close to me as she could. She wouldn't say a, say a word. She would just sit there with her mouth clamped shut and stare at me like a little snapping turtle. The only way I could break the spell was by giving her something or promising her something. Daisy, I said, if you won't be mad at me for losing your ribbons, I'll let you have Sally Gooden's next calf. Daisy's eyes lit up. She said, you will? I nodded my head. All right, Daisy said. I'm going to hold you to that. Let's shake hands on it. I shook hands with her and watched as she hobbled into the house, happy as a little lark. Daisy and I took turn about claiming Sally Gooden's calves. Even in that deal, I always came out on the short end. Every time it was Daisy's turn, Sally Gooden had a heifer calf. Every time it was my turn, she had a bull calf. Bull calves weren't worth 15 cents. I wasn't feeling too good when I went to bed that night. I had been, it had been a terrible day for me. Along with losing the coconuts, I had given up a calf and I was not any closer to getting my pony in my 22 than I was the day that Rowdy and I treed the first monkey. I hadn't completely given up on catching monkeys. I still had a lot of confidence in my old grandpa and with his help, I figured that in the long run, I'd come out all right. I always did. This has been chapter 12 of Wilson Rawls' book, Summer of the Monkeys.